Well, if you open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15, as we continue to work our way through the life of Abraham, and so far he's only been called Abram, okay? So try to catch me using his shorter name until he gets the longer name later. Genesis chapter 15, I entitled our time together, The Spiritual Birth That Finally Happens. As we've studied Abram's life, a large segment of time has come since God told Abraham with his wife to leave Ur. We saw what a metropolis that was, the center of world trade, and to leave it all and to go to a place that God had selected uh, for him. And we saw that um, two things that pretty well controlled Abraham's thought process. First of all, he was raised in Ur, and he had embraced the gods of Ur. Joshua tells us that what he grew up uh, serving uh, was the moon god there at Ur. It was the god of fertility. And keep in mind that God always uh, doesn't have blank illustrations. Well, uh, why did God use this illustration or that illustration? Notice that the God from Ur, this fertility God, is the one thing that Abraham has attached himself to because his wife is barren. So if anybody's going to get him a kid, this God ought to be able to do it, see? So as you think about it, uh, God goes on record and says, he's the one that opens and closes a womb. And so... Her womb is closed right now, and both he and his wife are getting older and older as time goes by. And uh, so God is weaning him off the other things that occupy his worship time. And God is also addressing something that he grew up embracing, like so many parents do today. We try to raise our children from being dependent upon us to being independent. And God calls us as parents to raise our children from dependence to us to be dependent upon the Lord. Independence stands in the way of all spiritual development. And as you think about that for a moment, remember that Abram has gotten ingrained in him from his daddy the importance of self-reliance. You can do it. Now, those two become liabilities. A religion that has been taught him ever since he was a little boy to give him something that he longed to have and the whole idea that if you just work hard enough, you can do it. And so far, it paid off for his dad and was paying off for him. He grew with great wealth. It was like, this really is working out well for me. Uh, and so when we see those kind of things that keep us from making a decision to put our faith and trust in Christ, the first thing that we need to do is really get a clear glimpse of who Jesus is. We saw last week that God gives Abram a clear glimpse of him after a military victory by sending Melchizedek to him, and he, is, remember, was the king of peace, He's also a priest. What is it that all of us need? We need somebody that will intercede for us before a holy God. And we need somebody that knows tomorrow to run our life that's all powerful. So with Melchizedek, Abram is getting a sense that this self-reliance really is not the way to go, that he needs a king to govern himself. And when he looks at his life and he looks back at the failures that he's had in his journey so far, the religion that he had embraced ever since he was a little boy wasn't working out very well either. And so with Melchizedek visiting him, notice Melchizedek is the king there at Salem, which is going to be Jerusalem. And as you 
see that. What is God really after? When I see Christ clearly, I'm challenged to make a choice about what I'm going to do with him. And that's what we spent some time developing, what faith is all about. Faith initially is believing or trusting in God's word and then acting upon it even when you can't see the results. But saving faith, even more specific, it's my acceptance that God accepts me not based upon what I have done, but totally believing or trusting in the acting upon what Christ has done for me at the cross. Now you're going to say, well, Christ hadn't gone to the cross yet. They look forward to Christ coming. We look back to it. That's the only difference as we see the book of Romans confirming that truth to us. So as we look at that, faith is going to strike at the very heart of his self-reliance. Because self-reliance is putting your faith in yourself. And that's the thing that if I did all the right things and if I lived my life good enough, I ought to be able to get my way to heaven. All of us here know people like that. They're good people. And they really do think that based upon their goodness, if anybody ought to go to heaven, they ought to. And so as you look at Abraham, you know, it's not like he can't stand the one true God. He just has the one true God along with all the other gods on his little mantle, and it all depends on what he wants as to which God it is he's going to turn to. So how in the world does God break through this? We get a hint here right off the bat in verse 1 of chapter 15. After these things, or after this uh, whole encounter with Melchizedek, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram. What would cause him to be afraid? He's got lots of things to be afraid about after coming back from this military victory because he doesn't have a walled city to live inside. He has no security. He doesn't even have any land to call his own. And it really doesn't matter because he doesn't even have an heir to send it to when he dies. Now God shows up in a dream. So far, everything God's told him to do has not been what Abram wanted to do. God says, leave here and go there. Abraham left here and went there. And he did it for anywhere from 13 to 40 years up here. It says he settled there. So everything that God had told him to do to this point has been partial obedience given enough time. Like so often you hear today, eventually I'll do it. I'm just not going to do it now. And so as he thinks, as he works his way back to where God told him to be in the very first place, well, then he's got all these herds, and what is he going to do with all? They're going to die on him because there's a famine in the land. So I'll go down to Egypt. Once again, God didn't tell him to go there. But he goes down to Egypt, and then he lies about his wife. And he's lucky to leave Egypt alive. And that is, once again, God not giving us what we deserve. The mercy of God and the grace of God. God also has the foreknowledge to know what actually is going to happen with Abram down the road. And so... Fear, just by way of a definition, is always a paralyzing emotion by design. Scripture commands me to embrace godly fear, which paralyzes me from doing the wrong thing as a result of a vibrant love for Christ. Scripture admonishes me to reject sinful fear when it paralyzes me from doing the right thing as a result of a deep-seated love for myself. When God tells me to share my faith, and I'm afraid, notice that the fear, a sinful fear, paralyzes me from doing a right thing. Why? Because I love myself instead of him. Sinful fear is not only loving the wrong object, but placing my faith in the wrong object as well. Abraham is fearful of God 
because his faith is resting in himself, not in the Lord. This self-reliance that has been taught to him as a little boy is now carrying with him into his adult life. And so as we look at this, God immediately addresses something that Abram or Abram is deathly afraid about, an encounter with God. And lots of times we think that way too, don't we? That if God talks to us, it's going to be something mean. He's going to tell me to do something that I'm not going to want to do. Young people grow up thinking that if you want to b trust God for the rest of your life, that he'll probably push you into the darkest part of Africa, and you'll never be able to raise enough support to even stay there, and you'll probably get diseased and die there, away from your family. That's what happens when you go where God wants you to go. Uh, and, and we grow up really anxious about ever saying yes to God for fear about where that's going to take us. Everything that God has said so far to Abram has uh, generated that kind of mistrust. It's always someplace he doesn't want to be. God says, just Abraham, you go. So what does he do? He takes his dad. And in order for him to leave his dad, his dad has to die. And even then, God says, just Abraham and Sarah go, and so he grabs his nephew Lot. So as you look at all this through, notice that when God tells us to do things, it's interesting how we procrastinate doing it, and all the other friend benefits that we take with us uh, that are later going to be thorns to us in our walk with the Lord. So... God uses fear, and uh, I've had people uh, tell me that, even with an invitation, that you really shouldn't talk much about hell because it's really not a genuine decision if you scared them into making a decision. Have you ever heard that? I've already put you guys to sleep. How many have heard that? Thank you. See, I knew you were there. In Jude, it's probably not your favorite book to turn to. It ought to be. It's really short. It's only got one chapter. You know, I, I'd give Mason, you, you pick uh, a book that you'll want to read through before tonight, and he'd pick Jude because it could take him three minutes to do it. Sorry, Mason, I just felt led to. And I prayed about not doing that this morning. Man, that didn't last long. <laughs> Jude, back to Jude, chapter 20, I mean chapter, verse 22, 23, chapter 1, in case you're looking through the chapters. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted with the flesh. God is saying that some people, depending on the experiences of their life, all they need to do is understand that God loves them. And that's all you need to share with them, and they're already ready to respond to him. The thief on the cross realized that Christ loved him. He didn't need to be convinced he was a sinner he was on the cross because he was a sinner. But Jude, the half-brother of Christ, also says, but others need to be taught the reality of hell. In fact, Christ talked more about hell than he did heaven. And he did it because he didn't want anybody to go to hell. When we talk about hell, because that doesn't fit our little box of who God is, we try uh, in our thinking today in evangelical circles is that, you know, if you don't accept Christ uh, and you die, you just cease to exist. You know, that, that's great. It's just not in your Bible. God says, no, you do live on. Your soul lives on. It's incorruptible. It's going to go on for eternity. And if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, 
it will be outer darkness. Have you ever heard? I've had people just hours away from dying in the hospital room and tell me, I'll go to hell if that's where my family is. And I had to tell them they'll never see their family. God says it's all alone in outer darkness where you'll be gritting your teeth in absolute pain forever and ever and ever. We don't like to talk about that. But in a comfortable setting in the United States, we are such a self-reliant individual that we cannot believe that there is a loving God that would do that. And to that, we just reply this, that God didn't make hell for people. He made it for the fallen angels. People go there because they reject God's ticket out. I go to hell because I chose to reject the only way to be saved. And all of the political things that are going on today, it was very interesting to hear about the argument about prayer with the coach over here and how terrible it was that prayer should be allowed in school. And the boisterous crowd said, why should a couple individuals make us be Christians? We don't want to be Christians. And you know what? God will never force anybody to be one but there'll be consequences if you choose not to. Now, as you think about this, he is afraid. He has seen Christ clearly, and he's afraid. And my friend, the soil has been properly prepared for his salvation. Let's look at how it unfolds to us in verses 1 through 5. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus, in other words, one of my slaves. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. Notice who's to blame. Who has he been praying for a child from? The moon god. But now it's God's fault that he hasn't done it. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be your heir. This guy is not going to be your heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own loins shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. As we look at this cluster of verses, Look what Christ, look what God guarantees to every human being who will put their faith and trust in him. I will be your shield. Shield from what? I mean, he had just got back from war, remember, battling these kings, and they could easily come back for him. I will be your shield. The first thing, Abram, that you need is a shield from your past. As you look back in your relationship and coming to know who God is, it has been one failure after another. And why should God ever want anything to do with me? Abram, I'm going to shield you from your past. I'm the only one that can take your past and blot it out. I'll shield you from it. I will intercede before a holy God for you. 